This video is sponsored by no one. The computer reviewed is one I purchased and wanted to share my thoughts with you. Special thanks to all new subscribers. I hope this video doesn't disappoint. Recently, I snagged a deal that you could consider something special. This mini PC was listed for $173, but there was an $80 coupon, so I got it for $93. It looks a lot like another mini PC I reviewed, but this one's a little different. It is the Kamari GK2 featuring an Intel Celeron J4105, a 4-core mobile processor with a base clock of 1.5 GHz and a burst up to 2.5 GHz, and 12 GB of low-power DDR4 RAM. Specs-wise, that's about the big difference between it and the AK2. Let's break down this machine though and see what it's all about. Included with the GK2 is an HDMI cable, Visa mount bracket, screws, power supply, and user manual. The front supports a light bar that is blue when on and red when sleeping. On the side from left to right is a USB 2 and two USB 3 ports and the power switch. I wonder if there's a card reader hidden under the cover as well like the last one. Around back we have a spot for a Kensington lock, combo mic and headphone jack, gigabit ethernet, two HDMI outputs capable of 4K, another USB 2 port, and 12 volt DC power input along with a little dust. At the top is the lever to take the cover off. This one also came in without the screw that would normally need removed to slide the lever. Under the top we see a spot for an SSD up to 2 terabytes. Compared to the AK2, there is no USB-C port under the hood, but we can see on the PCB where one would have been soldered on. It boots up just fine. The Finca RGT Apatite 6. Yeah, that looks good. BAD. Inside Windows 11, it looks like the SSD hasn't been powered on much at all, which is nice. Attributes for amount written and read seem missing, unless Crystal Disk Info just can't interpret the data. SSD speeds are on par for a SATA SSD. CPU-Z doesn't do much to identify the RAM at all. The built-in benchmark comes in at 197.5 single-core and 287.4 multi-core. It shows a multiplier ratio of 3.96, which is actually really good. Cinebench was a pain. The first run was abysmal, scoring only 570 in the multi-core test. The second run was done after Linux benchmarks to prove there was nothing wrong with the system. Final score was 391 single and 1,030 multi-core. I'm really not sure what was going on the first time. Inside Linux, Sysbench CPU benchmark came in at 1,494 single and 5,758 multi-core. Geekbench 5 scored it at 450 single and 1,363 multi-core. Here is an updated table and where it places in with relation to other tested systems from lowest to highest. I decided to see if this would do any better under Windows 10. It did in Cinebench, but worse under CPU-Z. Speaking of Windows 10, it was a clean install and as usual at this point, there were several items in the device manager that needed drivers. Like the AK2, the GK2 just required a run of Windows Update and selection of optional driver updates to fix the situation. YouTube playback was done under Windows 11. My 4K 30fps sample dropped about 4 out of 2000 frames. The 4K 60fps sample dropped 25 out of 2000, 17 at 1440p, and around 11 at 1080p. Selected videos at 1080 30fps had no drops. Overall, 30 FPS playback 1080 up to 4K should run fine, with some difficulty at 60 FPS. I did a different playback test for the AK2 after publishing and repeated it here. There is no issue playing back 4K 60 FPS video around 50 megabits per second from a USB 3 with Windows and TV movies, or my H.264, H.265, or VP9 files that are encoded over 100 megabits per second. I still haven't devised a list of games to purchase and try playing, so for now it's just widescreen Super Mario World, and it does just fine keeping 60 FPS. Tearing into the device, it's about the same as the AK2, 
though I realized I didn't have to take the hard drive holder out. Inside, there is no micro SD card reader on this machine, and the M.2 SATA drive is 22 by 42. The idea of swapping out the Windows 11 drive for one to install Windows 10 didn't work because the spare drive I have is 22 by 80. Memory again looks like two chips, and audio is provided by the Realtek ALC269. The network chip is hiding under the M.2 drive, and it is the now familiar RTL8111. Here are a few more pictures of random chips. The Wi-Fi chip is soldered on, as is the antenna lead, and the CPU thermal compound looks nice and malleable. Good job, whoever builds this style of machine. Power consumption was about 4 watts under Windows or Ubuntu, and I could see it down to 3 watts if I didn't have a USB drive plugged in, which I do often to run tests and programs. The highest power draw was around 14 watts during a Cinebench run. Temps got to around 76C, and according to one app, it was power limiting. In a Cinebench run, it would ramp up to about 2.5 GHz, then drop as low as 1.6, with a drop in power to around 10 watts. For those wondering, I did the temperature checks before tearing down this time. The fan in this Mini can cause some whining noise, which again I failed to capture. Otherwise, it would often just come on after the CPU had been running at 75C for an extended time. There is no easy way I can see to change the fan profile, and the BIOS is too locked down to see anything about thermal throttling. This is the first machine I wanted to send back when I started testing, simply because of the fan control. Considering I'm not going to end up using it as a Windows machine and pushing it to the limit, I think it'll be okay alongside its older sibling. While I'd consider the AK2 as a small form desktop, this GK2 would be even better with the newer processor and double the RAM capacity. That might lead it to work better as a media server too, allowing for a larger cache. For me, it's going in the lineup of many PCs that will be part of my lab when I move back south. I might have time to run a few tests before moving, but time is getting short and I have a few more episodes to put out. The next computer up for evaluation is another one that's under $100, and it's interesting to say the least. Also makes me want to go back and check one aspect of all mini PCs I've reviewed. What do you think? Would you consider buying this computer if it was back down under $100? I do think the list price is a little high, especially when you can get the likes of the U59 Pro for around that on sale. I've almost pulled the trigger on getting the successor to this one but decided against it as I have two N5000 series systems. If you have a mini PC, what do you use it for? Or just comment stick and I'll know you've made it this far. That is all for today's video. Until next time, I'm still good monkey. Thanks for watching. I hope that it wasn't terrible.